Welcome to Think Tech of Hawaii, Asia in Review. I'm Johnson Choi, the host. Today we are in a trip. We have a father and son team going to talk about Myanmar opportunity and challenge. First, I'd like to introduce the father, Michael An Chuang from the University of Hawaii. And the son, Mai Chui An Chuang from the National University of Singapore, visiting the father with the family uh, for a month. Uh, before I heard, hand the microphone over to the father and son team, um, I'd like to uh, talk about a little bit about Myanmar and how Myanmar might fit in the China's uh, one belt, one road. And especially uh, the reason, uh, not the reason, you know, late, uh, lately there's a uh, documentary by a, a British uh, producer. It's called The Coming War in China. Uh, they talk about uh, basically how the American uh, military base are surrounding China and how China is using the one belt one road and also uh, try to break the containment and Myanmar may be fitting into that formula. Uh, try to connect in the real road and also try to connect in the ceiling uh, using the one belt one road. So I'm going to pass a, a question to uh, Michael. Um, he will give us a little bit of uh, history about uh, Myanmar, uh, formerly was called uh, Burma. Michael? Okay. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Um, I don't like to use the term Burma anymore. It's a matter of habit. It's a colonial term. And um, what Muhammad Ali used to call a slave term for his name. Wow. He said, I'm not Cassius Clay, I'm Muhammad Ali. So I think we should respect what the Burmese people uh, want to call the country, which is Myanmar. Okay. Actually, there's a word that follows it, Myanmar Pie, uh, because Myanmar is an adjective, not a noun. But, um, you know, the UN and everybody else recognizes it, except for the US and a couple of nations. Okay. <coughs> Um, the, long, the history with, with China goes way back, um, at least to the Sui and Tang, if not, if not earlier. Um, and they've always had a good contacts, trade, as well as diplomatic, as well as political relations, cultural relations too. And um, Myanmar used to see China as the big brother and used to see China, the north, as a, the front door of Myanmar rather than the back door. The West came in through the back door, and they thought that was the front door. So the Myanmar people were looking the other way, and they said, oh, these Myanmar people, they look the other way. And so they must be xenophobic and inside looking and not outward looking. But actually, it's because the West came in through the back door. They weren't looking backwards, they were looking forward. And for a long time, China was the front door. And still, I think, in my opinion anyway, I think it still is, in many ways, the front door. Uh, it's certainly its closest neighbor, um, and it's certainly a strong neighbor, economically and politically now, and it has been throughout the Tang and the Sui and the Ming too, less the Ming, but more the Tang uh, dynasties. Um, and it has been a continuous relationship, flow of goods, flow of people, flow of cultural things, um, religion even, in some ways, architecture, art, and, and many other things. For one time, uh, Burma was a colony, right? Um, Myanmar, Burma, yes, it was called, it was a colony under the British. The British colony, right? British colony, and that's when the term Burma became to be used, and it was, so it's a colonial term, it's a, it's a British term. There's no er sound in, in Burmese, and there's no Burma. If you ask an ordinary guy in, in Myanmar who, who doesn't speak English, he won't say Burma, he'll say Myanmar Pie, because the word doesn't exist in the Burmese language or in any of the indigenous languages. It's only is known as Myanmar in the country by the indigenous groups as well as by the Burmese speakers. So the former uh, Burma was a British colony, just mm -hmm. like uh, India, just like Singapore, mm -hmm. just like Hong Kong, and many other places. Mm -hmm. And how does, uh, you know, some of those places like uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, or, or you know, you know, in some way in the India may turn out quite okay after the British left. And, and what happened to Burma or Myanmar today? Well, for one thing, um, Myanmar was in rule for two or three hundred years like India was. We had a lot of time for the British to have the impact felt. Or the Philippines with the Americans, um, or with Malaysia and, and Singapore. It was only about 70 years of British rule, and then it was taken piecemeal fashion, and they came across a very powerful 
civilization, a very powerful kingdom. So there was a lot of resistance. And part of the problems at independence was because of this resistance. It's not just, you know, rolling over and playing dead when the British came. Um, and it was, it was quite antagonistic. And it, the way to resolve decolonization has a, has a lot to play with it. And the decolonization created a civil war. And this is actually his spirit of study. My period of study goes before that. Uh, and the decolonization created a lot of problems. Let's say Singapore and Malaysia didn't go through the same kind of decolonization, or Vietnam, the same kind of decolonization that Myanmar and Vietnam and Cambodia went through. Uh, it's much easier for Malaysia and Singapore. In fact, I would argue that Singapore didn't have a decolonization period. Um, so you know, that it matters uh, what happened at decolonization after World War II. So what kind of role uh, China has played uh, historically uh, with uh, you know, the Myanmar? It's, it's been, it's been uh, political. Uh, it's tried in the Yuan dynasty, the Mongol dynasty, it, it, it tried to uh, assert its power, but the Mongols were defeated by the Burmese three times. The Chinese don't like to admit it, but it's in the Yuan sources. Uh, it's, it's in there. The Ming also put some assertions on uh, military and political relations and assertions on, on Myanmar, but the, it was more cordial in the, in the Ming period. In fact, I'm, I'm doing a book right on the Ming period right now, uh, Myanmar in, during the Ming period. Um, the Qing had less of a, uh, an influence. The um, Republican period, the um, Mao Zedong's era had influence on, on, on Myanmar, um, in particularly the, the system of state. Um, they looked to China as a model in, in many ways. Um, but of course, you know, Myanmar is a very, very devoutly Buddhist state, so you can only do so much uh, in that in that uh, political relations if it doesn't jive with the, with the religious aspects. And there's the language differences, politically, diplomatically, militarily, culturally, dress, food, so on. Um, you can see Chinese and Myanmar relations interact throughout the centuries. So a lot of those relationships are based on like trade or? Trade too, trade, trade culture, everything else. And it's been both, it's been a mixed picture, both a positive, uh, type of relationship as well as a negative one. There have been wars between the two places, but um, and you you win some, you lose some, and in some cases the Ming did lose, uh, I think three times, and in some cases the Qing lost once. But the Mongols invaded Myanmar you know, quite um, deeply, but they didn't win entirely either. Well, maybe we uh, fast forward to a little bit more. Uh modern history and then maybe for some people that uh, may not know where Myanmar is, you know, uh, actually Myanmar is uh, stuck between Laos, Thailand, uh, Bangladesh and China. So they border quite a few nations. Um, and, and I guess, uh, uh, you know, this is the, probably the picture boy or picture girl of the, <laughs> of the West, you know, the uh, jungle of art of uh, Myanmar and uh, I guess, uh, when was the democratic election uh, in, in Myanmar? There's been several elections. Several, I mean, the latest several elections. The when, last when one she was, in was uh, kind of uh, the, the well, she, leader. She joined um, in 2012 for a by-election, which followed the 2010 election. I see. Um, so she was able to join the government then, but she was elected into her position now in 2015. Uh, where her party, the National League for Democracy, um, swept the elections. I see. And, and, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, because in America, you <coughs> basically just hear what uh, the Western media say. The New York Times, the CNN, and, and Washington Post, and sometimes you read one, you read them all the same. And uh, I was told the, the, the perspective of the, age, uh, the, the Western world look at uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, maybe uh, slightly different from how the Myanmar people look at her, or how the Asian nations, you know, look at her. Uh, how, why is there a discrepancy somehow? Well, her image has changed over the years. I mean, during the time when the military government was still implementing its so-called roadmap to democracy, which was implemented in about 2003 or so, um, there was a very much an antagonistic relationship between the West and Myanmar. They imposed economic sanctions, which of course meant that the engagement with Myanmar wasn't very, uh, wasn't very close. But Asian countries such as China and ASEAN nations and India 
um, did engage. So during this time, um, Aung San Suu Kyi, as a political opposition leader, was really the face of Myanmar. She was seen to be, in a sense, representing the Myanmar people. So just as the Myanmar people were being, in a sense, held down by a military government, so too was she also under house arrest. Right. So this type of um, symbolic um, relationship um, was held by most of the Western media because it, it was a very strong, essentially anti-Myanmar uh, perspective on the country and its political landscape. But as changes started occurring within the country, as the military's plan to implement a new constitution and a new government um, started to take uh, place, um, this started to change the West's perception of her um, as well. She became part of a government. Right. If it wasn't so clear-cut anymore, which side, in a sense, did she belong to? Now, as a leader, she has to take the very difficult position of leading a country through this transition from essentially a socialist economy to a much more market-oriented one. And this is where the challenge lies for her. And this is also where her perception from the outside has also changed. Folks are now starting to question her government's ability to manage the investment, the infrastructural development, and the capacity building that has been so, um, so, so very much needed uh, within the country. She has also been criticized about her policies concerning uh, migrant communities that have been coming in and, and coming through Myanmar and leaving Myanmar uh, on the western part of the country, in Yakin State. Um, these challenges, of course, are part of long-term processes and dynamics that have challenged most leaderships within the country. And so part of the changes in her perception have to do with changes from the outside and how people perceive uh, her. Right now, they're starting to question her, her image as this beacon of liberal democracy. They're starting to wonder whether she's able to uphold these principles and whether her government is going to be able to, um, to meet the types of expectations that many of her voters expected uh, when she came to office. Some would actually say, because Mother Sue is in government, all our problems are solved. Well, obviously, if, you, you know, if you've seen the challenges that have been happening in the country, this is obviously going to take much more than just electing one person into government. I guess, you know, sometimes you as an opposition party or you are the single voice to oppose the, what we call the, the people in power. Of course, when you are not in the position to do anything, it's easy to criticize. And during our discussion before our meeting, you know, and Taiwan is a very good example, you know, uh, the current DPP swept into power because they criticized the uh, KMT could not do anything. And Ma ying of course, lost, you know, the, the, the KMT lost the, the, the presidency. Now she is being put in the position, trying to run the country, mm -hmm. and she runs, she runs into all kinds of problems because now you cannot criticize her anymore. You have to do something. Right. You have to perform, yeah. right? And she's very inexperienced. Well, okay. Yeah. So uh, you also mentioned that uh, she wants to be the, like the minister of five different departments. It, 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 it took know. people by surprise. Um, when she, part of this has to do with the Constitution um, that prohibits her from being um, president. And so to get around this and to in negotiation with the incumbent political uh, party, the USDP, as well as the military, they found perhaps what probably was the best route was to enable her to create a position which calls called state counselor, which essentially allowed her to be above the president, nice. which was surprised people because here is a leader supposedly espousing democratic uh, views and she is creating a position that perhaps sounded a bit undemocratic. And in addition, she initially mentioned that sh and, and said that she would be overseeing five key portfolios um, of government. And in a place like Myanmar, where institutions are very weak, um, and each of these portfolios, whether it's education, ethnic affairs, and so on, um, are, require a lot of attention, to take five different portfolios, which is the equivalent of running five different uh, departments like of education, of transport, and so forth, would seem a bit ambitious for anybody to take over. So this rubbed some people the wrong way and also raised questions as to um, whether sh she actually has the ability to actually see in realistic terms the challenges that are facing the country. It's almost like uh, Donald Trump wants to be the Secretary of State, yes. <laughs> head of Department of Commerce, Right, Defense. paper secretary. Exactly, right. exactly. <laughs> and her children taking over the rest of the departments. So, <laughs> so, so, this, so this also was a contributing factor to questioning 
um, her image. Before, as an activist, it's easy to speak about things in abstract ideological yeah. terms. But in real politics, you have to have uh, the ability to actually really have administrative skills to run a, a government. And she was facing, to be fair, enormous challenges. She's facing basically a pre-war, a post-war economy that's had very little uh, economic development. Capacity is, is very poor. And you were dealing with a population that's, that has potential, but it also required the type of technical training that you need to develop an infrastructure. So she's facing all these challenges, plus internal political division and factionalism. So whether it was her or whether it was a different leader, um, they'd be facing a, a massive challenge. So change is not going to happen overnight. Okay, uh, we are going to a, a, a short commercial right now, so uh, we'll be back in a minute. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. I'm Jay Fidel, and I'm the host of Research in Manoa, Mondays from 12 to 1 on thinktechhawaii.com. Take a look at us and learn about uh, geophysics, learn about planetology, learn about the ocean and earth sciences at UH Manoa. You'll really enjoy it. So come around, we'll see you then. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage here on Think Tech. This show is so very dear to my heart. We talk with artists of various different ilk here about the process that they go through for their art. So we talk about what they're doing, why they are doing it, how they do it. And um, it's a show that is inspiring. This is what I hear from people all the time. And a show that will teach you something, sometimes something about yourself. I hope you'll join us. The show is Center Stage. It's on Think Tech every Wednesday at 2 o'clock. We'll see you then. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Asian Review. I'm Johnson Choi, the host. OK, uh, before we go into a break, we're talking about, you know, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, current challenge, you know, from a uh, opposition leader uh, without the power, basically just criti criticizing the, the people in power. Now, she seems to have the power, but she has a challenge to deliver uh, what she tried to criticize the prior government, and, and she tried to do some micro. Uh, can you add, give us uh, some viewpoint from your perspective? Yeah, uh, if, you, if you think of the enormous challenges that Maitri has talked about dealing with the whole country, and you think about a department that I used to be chair of, which is a small department at UH, the same sort of problems can exist, and it's even five years isn't enough to, to settle those. Can you imagine being uh, head of uh, five ministries trying to solve all those problems? And that will give you an idea of um, how it's far more difficult to be sitting in the position of chair and far easier to be a critic sitting in the, the rest of the audience, as, as you suggested. And I, I know her personally because we were in Kyoto together and our families were there together. Our children played with each other. And she had always been very, very authoritarian, personally. Although out of her mouth came democracy, her personal character was one of, um, of being an authoritarian, no criticism, very thin skin. And, and uh, like, just like her father, the father of the modern Burma was very much authoritarian, authoritarian too. And so she was essentially replacing, trying, although she spoke of democracy and the West uh, went along with her, um, she was essentially replacing one authoritarian government with another authoritarian government. So if she wanted to replace the guy she's trying to overthrow, she's just as authoritarian as they are. So yeah, it's far easier to be a critic than to be um, a doer of things and move things. And she has very, very little, if no experience, in governance itself. Whereas the party that she was trying to overthrow, the USDP, uh, had quite a few decades of experience in infrastructural development, quelling rebellions, uh, law and order, and all that stuff. They were not good economists, but they could at least provide social order, which is what I think most of the people want. Uh, they, they want not to have to fight every day or have bombs dropped on them every day. They'd rather have social stability. They want to be able to go in the countryside without the trains being blown up by the insurgents all the time, that sort of stuff. She had no experience in that whatsoever. She was just a, um, let's say, amateur when it comes to governing. So, so a lot of government, they get into power, you know, if they, 
himself or herself doesn't have the experience. A lot of time, they what they call they have advisors. And mm -hmm. since she was the poster girl for the Western nations, I mean, doesn't American or the British will be uh, volunteering some of their service and and charge? Well, she's also very stubborn personally, so oh, she so doesn't she doesn't okay. like advice. And Marjorie can speak more of that with regard to her own party. She has advisors in her own party, but she doesn't necessarily listen to them. I mean, she, Does she, she have advice very, from anyone? Well, uh, listen, it's important to remember that the start of the NLD, which came in 1988 was led, not actually by her, but former generals who were purged by a different generation of generals. So the NLD was actually being run by uh, another military group. So you have, and she was just uh, an underling, but she rose to leadership. She does have a core group of folks that are uh, part of the executive uh, committee of the National League for Democracy, but that core group has aged and they haven't brought any new blood into that party. And that's been a bone of contention for many of the NLD younger members. There was a convention in 2013, a national congress, to vote for who should be coming into the executive committee. Very few, if not any, were allowed to come into the, into the uh, internal uh, committee. And there has been dissension within the National League of Democracy as well. Mm. Um, during the 2010 elections, a group, a more moderate group, who wanted to engage the process that was established by the military, broke off and said, we want to take part in the elections. Her group, which were mainly the hardliners, said, no, we don't want to. So eventually this group has come over and become part of, this, of the process. But there is still this internal um, dissension amongst the groups. And, f and politicians now, especially uh, provincial leaders, have suggested that they may break off and form a new political party to contest the next elections uh, coming forth. And that's actually at the heart of the real problem for Myanmar, is often the unity. There's a lot, political parties tend to factionalize and break away. And so when you need to focus on transitions to build an infrastructure which requires years to implement, this political turmoil, this factionalism and in, in, um, infighting creates obstacles for <coughs> that smooth uh, transition. So part of the biggest challenge for economic development and political development in the country is this internal infighting, which is happening even within her own. So will a, a strong government be more useful? Because a lot of times the Western countries always uh, oversell the term democracy. Mm -hmm. I mean, as you find out from middle years, even to Asia, if you look at Taiwan, which are observed every day, I mean, it, it's, they have fist fight in, in, in the council, mm -hmm. in the legislative council. I mean, they're actually fighting and punching each other. And, and, and everything is on a standstill. Everything is, is, is you know, they, they don't focus on economy anymore. They just focus on mm -hmm. grabbing the power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think especially at this moment of transition, when you're transitioning away from A, a civil war, economic change as well as political change, you need to have a stable government. One that is able to also look for long-term planning. At this stage, it's not clear whether this particular administration has those priorities in mind. Whereas other, uh, the current opposition party, the USDP, and other um, political parties that are also part of the mix, it's not just between two parties, there's several political parties, um, these folks have to be able to demonstrate much more long-term thinking. A key problem that we haven't heard about with the NLD is about succession. What happens when Don Sasuchi retires and, and that, that executive committee? Who's going to come up behind them? What are their plans? What, are, what do they see as the, the, the next 20 years of economic development? We haven't heard any of these types of things. No. And that's where the real risk comes in about but, the future. And the other thing is you ask about democracy as this uh, solve all thing. Yeah. Like um, a magic yeah, wand. Yeah, it's a magic wand. You wave it and everything's going to be hunky dory. But is, what we tend to forget about, about Myanmar is that it's less ideological, really, than bread and butter issues. And if those are solved first, then the ideology can follow. But we have the cart uh, turned around, you know, the, the horse before the cart, or the cart before the horse, uh, where they want the ideology first, and not the practical stuff, the economic development, the uh, access to clean drinking water, education, uh, um, you know, infant mortality rates, all those kind of things that have to happen first, I think. And, and succession, of course, is ideological in a sense. You have to have a constitutional um, statement on what the succession is about. But I think much of the problems that the, rest, the West didn't see, they just saw the ideology, democracy, 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 is that the, these, most of these conflicts and these factions and so on are bread and butter issues. 
Yeah, like a lot of uh, even in the United States, still remember the the, the the time when the American economy was uh, was good, like during mm -hmm. the Clinton time. You know, mm -hmm. when he do a lot of stupid things in the White House, nobody cared, right? Yeah. When the economy is bad, then everybody start you know finding someone to blame. Right. And typical is the government. So maybe we sidestep the the politics in Myanmar because that is a long term things that we're not going to solve in the next two years or no. maybe longer. Uh, with the China focusing on the one belt one road and try to uh, bring prosperity, basically to to they don't China doesn't talk about democracy. They basically say how we can improve the life of the people. I mean the 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 the, the basic people, you know, to bring in more trade, more business, like bring the will to to have the the good can be uh, transport around the Asian Europe. How do you see? Uh, if that China formula becomes successful in the next five years, uh, would that help Myanmar? Absolutely. I mean, um, economic development is key to Myanmar's future prosperity, and the Chinese have been investing, you know, 200 billion since 1980, as opposed to 200 million uh, that the U.S. has invested. I mean, even the U.K. has invested four billion, you know, into into Myanmar since. Since Even Vietnam has invested more than, yeah. than the U.S. So, I mean, in terms of um, the economic uh, strategy of the Chinese, um, it's it's very conducive to the types of priorities that Myanmar has. They have they need infrastructural development, um, they need capacity training. I mean, they and they need to have the resources to develop this. But we have to bear in mind, though, that a lot of this incoming uh, in, uh, investment is also lubricating the differences amongst the different uh, factions. So money, money lubricates these divisions, as does a political system such as democracy. It highlights and amplifies these, these differences. So how the Myanmar government is able to manage this is going to be key to whether this type of strategy by the Chinese is successful or not. I think in the long run, um, by promoting development, um, over you know politics that's, that's that will be rece received um, probably more easily by local governments I than see. would say political ideology and so forth that's often coming I in see, from the West. Michael, we have a uh, 15 seconds you want to add to uh, Maitri have to say before we end the program. Nothing much except I'd like to reiterate that this what I used to call democracy jihad. It's not going to work. Okay. It hasn't worked. Okay. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, okay, Maitri, thank you for thank coming. You for Michael, us. thank you for coming. Thank you for okay. having us. Thank you for uh, watching my show. Uh, this is my last show for 2016. Uh, hopefully to see you again in the near future. Aloha. Aloha.